For those who don't know me, I'm Laura Schnur, Director of Climate Transitions with Tamarack Institute. And I'm joined today by my colleagues, John and Renike with SDSN Canada. Before we get started and dive into the conversation, I do wanna take a moment to acknowledge the lands we're calling in from. Most of us on this call are joining from across Turtle Island. And while I'm joining today from Oxford in the UK, Tamarack and SDSN's offices are on the traditional territory of the Adawandara, Neutral, Anishinaabeg, and Haudenosaunee peoples. Kitchener Waterloo is situated in the Haldimand Track, the land promised to the Six Nations, that includes 10 kilometers on each side of the Grand River. So I invite everyone to reflect on the lands you are on. And if you're not sure what those lands are, we encourage you to check out nativeland.ca. So we do land acknowledgements, not only to acknowledge the traditional unceded and stolen lands we are joining from, but as part of our commitment to advancing truth and reconciliation in our communities. And so as we reflect on the lands we're all joining from, let's also reflect on the state of reconciliation in so-called Canada. A recent report from Yellowhead Institute provided a status update on the 94 calls to action in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's final report released in 2015. So there were no calls completed in 2023. And in the eight years since the release of the report with the 94 calls to action, 81 calls remain unfulfilled. So that is really shocking. That was shocking for me personally to um, be reminded of and to see the update from last year. And I think about how many years it would take to achieve all of these if we continue going at that pace. So the other, another key report is the um, report, the calls to justice in the final report on the of the national inquiry into missing and murdered indigenous women and girls and with this this was released in 2019 and included 231 calls to justice of those 231 only two were found to have been completed as of june 2023 and so the sdgs are really a complementary framework to these to um this these calls to justice, to the TRC calls to action, to UNDRIP, and taken together, these represent an agenda for all of us. And we know that we can't achieve an agenda as bold and ambitious as the SDGs, or for that matter, these others, in silos. If we are to achieve these, it will be in partnership. So that was really the impetus for today's conversation and in, for enjoying, inviting these special guests to join us. And just a reminder, this session is part of our monthly community of practice series on this localizing the sustainable development goals, but we have advertised it more widely given the topic is of great interest to learners across our network. So you'll see in the chat a link uh, for how to join the COP if you're interested in coming to ongoing sessions and next month we will continue to focus on this topic. So John, I'll pass it to you to introduce our speakers and kick off the conversation. Thank you, Laura, and uh, hi everyone. Great to uh, great to be hosting this conversation today, and thank you again to our speakers for for joining us to share their insights and expertise. And, uh, we have a great lineup today, and and the format we'll take is really kind of panel conversation. Uh, so we'll be we'll be um, we have a series of questions that we'll we'll kind of work together with the speakers to to go through and explore. Uh, so I'm happy to uh, introduce our speakers today. Uh, on the left on your screen here, Jenica and Cornish, the Assistant Manager for Projects at the Mount Aerosmith Biosphere Region Research Institute, which is hosted at, at Vancouver Island University. We have Joshua McNeely, the Director of Environment for the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples. Uh, and we have Marshall Gallardo, who's project advisor, uh, First Nations Community Economic Development Initiatives with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. So a great uh, series of uh, expertise uh, and, um, uh, and insight that we've assembled today. And uh, with that, we'll just dive right in. 
Uh, and this first question, we'll just kind of start things off with more introductions, but maybe Joshua, I, I could ask you to start. Um, if you could just introduce yourself, you know, your organization and, and some of the work you do as, as it relates to building partnerships. Well, thanks, John. Um, yeah, uh, the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples, um, I mean, I'm, I'm here as a director of environment, uh, but uh, I'm not going to be talking too much about environment. Uh, Congress of Aboriginal Peoples uh, is a very broad organization established in, um, in 1971. Uh, and, um, you know, it works to uh, better the, the socioeconomic uh, uh, status of people, Indigenous peoples who live off the reserve. Um, to uh, just give you a bit of breakdown of, of some numbers, um, there's about 1.8 million uh, Indigenous peoples within Canada. Those are 2021 20, uh, census numbers. Um, about 975,000 of those, or over half, are non-status. Uh, if you look at the Métis uh, population, again, you're about three quarters uh, do not uh, are, are not part of the the, the Métis Nation. Uh, that's the the agreements that the federal government has with. Uh, various uh, Métis organizations in uh, uh, out west. Um, well, I should say before I continue on uh, that you asked me to comment on, on where we're calling in from. I always forget this because uh, I've, I've been around so long. I remember the days when people first started doing that, and uh, it still still catches me by surprise that uh, people recognize lands, and it's it's, it's very nice. But uh, I'm calling in from uh, Mi'kma'ki. Uh, it's the traditional ancestral homeland of the Mi'kmaq people in the east. Uh, pre precisely, I'm, I'm in uh, modern-day Nova Scotia. Um, but anyways, back to my numbers. Uh, the the Métis uh, across Canada, about three quarters, uh, or do not belong to one of the Métis organizations that uh, the federal government has has uh, agreements with. And then as far as the Inuit, um, about a third actually live outside of of uh, Inuit uh, Nunagat. So uh, you add all that together, you're looking about 82% or so of Indigenous peoples uh, who do not live on uh, a reserve. And this creates uh, tremendous problems for Indigenous peoples to, for representation, certainly, uh, toward the in, in the halls of government, as well as receiving uh, access to, to benefits and services that the federal government has. Um, CAP, therefore, tries to advocate for uh, those uh, people across the country um, and, uh, and, and provide some services to those who, who fall in, in that uh, very massive crack. Uh, CAP is actually uh, made up of 11 affiliate organizations across Canada uh, who, who, are rec who are registered provincially uh, as a society or a, a nonprofit organization, and that's because there's no there's no space within the Federal Indian Act to register uh, uh, organizations uh, that are, are off uh, reserve or, or not status. Uh, the programs and services that uh, that CAP or its affiliate organizations run range uh, from housing, economic development. Skills training, uh, healthcare education, finance, governance, um, uh, quite a wide range of things. I wouldn't say anything is um, generate gen has its genesis in the SDGs. Certainly, everything we do is about sustainable development, um, but we, um, uh, you know, to this day don't have a specific project on, or initiative on the sustainable development goals. We would like to, we believe in um, having a transformative change toward a better future. And I think the SDGs are, are very instrumental in bringing about this change. But the reality for CAP and its affiliate organizations is that we are up against a, a very hard brick wall of a federal government and provincial governments who do not want to see that change for our community. Just as one example, I mean, you mentioned, um, uh, Jessica, that you were surprised about the 94 calls to actions not being implemented fast enough. 
Um, well, our experience is, um, you know, in 1999, CAP, uh, and it was actually one of our founding presidents, uh, Harry Daniels, there's, there's our Canada Post's uh, uh, post, uh, postage uh, uh, stamp for Harry Daniels for his work that he's done. In 1999, uh, raised the issue with the with the uh, federal court, asking uh, that uh, the court declare that these non-status and Métis people uh, are Indians within Section 9124 of the Constitution. That was important uh, because, as I said, the uh, there's a wide chasm for people being able to access services and programs and to have their voice heard. And to be and to better their socioeconomic status, where on one hand you go to a provincial government and they look at you and they say, "Well, you are an, an Indian, uh, or you are an Indigenous person, and therefore you should go to the federal government to have your issue resolved." And then the federal government turns around and says, "Well, you are not a status Indian, so therefore you need to go to the provincial government to seek uh, your service or, um, or whatever it is that you need." So a very uh, this political football back and forth, and the government did not want to recognize non-status and and Métis people. That was a 17-year court battle, and that wasn't resolved until 2016. And the Supreme Court um, came out and said, "What well, you know?" In, during the hearing, says, "What are we doing here? Everybody knows the answer to this question. It's a very obvious answer. These people are indigenous." And by virtue of being indigenous, therefore, they fall under Section 9124. It's a very simple uh, question. The response of the federal government was that, you, you know, even if you make this declaration, you cannot compel us to act upon it. You cannot compel us to legislate, which is true in our, in our system. But um, I encourage everybody to read the Daniels case that came out from the Supreme Court in April of, of 2016. And I think that would set the um, a bit of an understanding of where we are coming at uh, from our desire to be uh, involved in SD, the work of the SDGs, the desire to improve uh, people's living standards and their status, or their socioeconomic status, I should say, their political status, to, um, to be able to seek transformative change but up against a wall of opposition. And so, you know, it doesn't surprise me that um, that the 94 uh, calls to action haven't been completed. It's a reality that we deal with every single day, um, as well as, you know, all the calls from the uh, murdered and missing women uh, inquiry, all the calls that came out from the uh, Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples in 96, um, the, uh, the, the, the 46 articles, of the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. You know, all these are very fundamental things that uh, we are still fighting every day to have a place and a, and a face at the table in order to be a part of this change. So uh, the SDG work is important and, and I hope to talk about some, some uh, examples of where we've, we've done sustainable development or are currently doing sustainable development in, in some of our programs but there's the uh, the big uh, picture of are we ready for change in this country and how do we enable it? Thanks. Thank you so much, Joshua, for uh, really impactful remarks. And I think, you know, you touched on a number of really key areas and just related to the SDGs that thought about the opportunity they may present as a, as a lever towards transformative change. And you know, it's not necessarily about we're all working on SDG and then put in the, you know, whatever number it is and be able to align so concretely, but it's about the issues underpinning all of that and kind of what the spirit of the SDGs is, is about to drive transformative change and how do we leverage that? Is this an opportunity to do that? Um, so I think we, we can explore that a little bit as we get into the, into the panel. So thank you for that. Um, maybe Jenica, maybe I'll, I could I could give you the floor as well to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about the partnerships work um, that you're involved with. 
Sure. Thanks, John. And thanks to SDSN Canada and the Tamarack Institute for hosting this event. Um, and it's really cool to see all the, I'm seeing all the, the chats pop up of where everyone's calling in from. Um, so that's really cool. Appreciate everyone joining today. Um, yeah, my name is Janica. I am grateful to be calling in from the traditional territories of the Snanamook First Nation. So I work at the Mount Aerosmith Biosphere Region Research Institute, or MABRI for short, which is what I'll refer to it as moving forward. Um, so we're hosted at Vancouver Island University, and we act as the research and education arm for the UNESCO designated Mount Aerosmith Biosphere region. So biosphere regions are designated globally um, to model solutions for a sustainable future, to conserve and celebrate biological and cultural diversity, um, and to empower people to engage with nature and with one another um, in healthier ways. So there are over 700 biosphere regions that are designated globally. We have 19 in Canada, um, all operating under common values of UNESCO, but um, very incredibly unique in the way that organizations function and operate through their governance and the community relationships that they build. Um, so for ourselves at the Mount Aerosmith Biosphere Region, we are located within the traditional territories of seven First Nations of the Coast Salish and New Chalneth tribes, which is located on the east coast of Vancouver Island in British Columbia. And we, the Biosphere Region was designated in 2000 and the Research Institute was established in 2014. Um, and neither of these things would have been possible to do without the relationship building and continuous work that goes into making connections in our region um, and really building long lasting relationships that are reciprocal in nature and prioritize community needs um, and are meaningful for everybody who is involved. So as a research institute, um, our a lot of our focus is is in conducting applied research initiatives, but um, and they range in scope from like we do things ranging from habitat and species research and monitoring to supporting community planning with First Nations and municipalities. But all of these things kind of have the the centric focus of being done through the priority of what community um, wants to address in our region. And when I say community, that kind of, that includes First Nation partners that we work with, as well as local stewardship organizations, local government, um, as well as industry and business. And so we operate through a model where all of these groups come together and we identify what needs to be addressed in our region, what should be prioritized, what are the questions that we wanna answer and how do we continue to engage the rest of the community to do these things. So relationship building is really at the core of everything that we do at our research institute. And um, I see some of my biosphere region colleagues on this call and I know that it's at the core of across all biosphere regions of, of all the work that's being done. Um, and hopefully I can speak to that a little bit more as we move through, but Maybe to just just to close out here, because biosphere regions do have a designation from the United Nations, they are inherently connected to frameworks like the SDGs and the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So um, some biosphere regions may not specifically do work in this area, but the overarching spirit and intent of these frameworks comes to light in a lot of the different types of community engagement, research and education initiatives that these organizations do. Um, our research institute has done some specific work around the SDGs and UNDRIP, um, which I can maybe get into a little bit more later, but I will leave it there for now. Thank you. That'd be great. Yeah, really interesting to hear more on that too. Thank you, Jenica. Um, and uh, Marshall, over to you. Please let us uh, tell us a little bit about your, your work and partnerships. Great. Thanks, John, and thanks uh, to my colleagues here uh, who are on the call. Uh, I'm coming to you from uh, um, Algonquin Anishinaabe Territory, otherwise uh, for me, um, Ottawa. And uh, I'm part of the SETI um, program. The long name is the uh, First Nations Municipal Community Economic Development Initiative for Long, which is a mouthful, so we just call it SETI. Uh, to recognize that SETI is actually a partnership. So uh, our partnership, uh, FCM and CanDo, based in um, 
in Edmonton, Can Do is a, uh, an organization that's dedicated to the training of uh, economic development officers, uh, Indigenous economic development of officers across Canada. And FCM is the advocating voice, lobbying voice for all municipalities or for the good most part of municipalities across the, across the country. So together uh, we uh, uh, implement uh, SETI and we have been doing so for two phases now. Uh, SETI has been uh, in existence for 11 years now. And we've worked across Canada uh, in all provinces and some territories, uh, specifically with First Nations. So to date, we have not unfortunately received too much funding to work with Metis in, in Inuit uh, lands, but uh, we're hoping to get there one day as we wear, uh, rise, raise the awareness that this partnership work from nation to municipalities is greatly needed in all, uh, in all nations. So uh, we hope to achieve that in this coming uh, phase, hopefully, uh, of SETI. Um, SETI is, is really dedicated to the promotion, building, fostering, harnessing, and encouraging uh, municipal and uh, nation partnerships at different levels, at a cultural level, educational level, social level, and also at a, an economic level. Um, community economic development collaborative um, notion as well. While, while a lot of our partnerships start out really working on getting to know each other, getting to know each other's history, getting to know how we work at a governance level or at a community economic uh, development level, we do first and foremost focus on having a good relationship amongst each other. So a lot of our work is spent on relationship building, relationship uh, harnessing, fostering, and getting to know each other with the hopes that we can get to a stage where we're collaborating on meaningful uh, community economic development projects. And the key word there is community, regular economic development sometimes is focuses on numbers and to see how much profits or how much uh, uh, economic stimulus that might be in a community, but we really try to stick to that community local feel so that there is social benefits to both communities um, involved or well, all our partnerships, but both nation and the municipality must uh, benefit from uh, their collaboration from each other. So I'll leave it at that. As we know we want to get to other topics, but I'm happy to be on this call. Thank you, Marshall. And actually I might, uh... I might follow up with you and we can kind of dive into some of the other questions from there. Um, and you started touching on it, you know, the, the, the importance of building that relationship. Um, I know that with SETI, you have a toolkit that you've released that kind of helps talk about the process by which relationship can move into collaboration, uh, like you, you had mentioned and beyond. And so can you tell us a little, talk a little bit about that kind of those fundamental aspects of that relationship building, moving mm -hmm. that into collaboration, um, and then, you know, where it goes from there. Can you share a little bit more on that on that side of it? Sure. Uh, now, uh, I invite everybody to really look, uh, visit our setipartnerships.ca page. You'll find the toolkit there. Now, the toolkit is a fairly lengthy, lengthy uh, document, but it is a toolkit. So it's framed by by steps and uh, phases, and it's you know it's a guide you can follow. But we really um, uh, we really start with uh, this uh, conversing with each other, visioning, then really identifying uh, things of action to then uh, actioning together, right? So it's kind of like a four stage process and a framework that we've invented or come up with. Really, I don't know if it's invented. I think it's used in many places. But more than that, I think. Uh, when I was reflecting on a forward question that you had uh, mentioned, John, talked about approaches. And I think approaches, there could be many. There could be strategic approaches. There could be collaborative approaches. There could be um, all, all sorts of uh, uh, objectives of why forming a relationship. But I don't think that should guide the relationship building. I think there is other things that make uh, the um, visioning process more collaboratively, or the or the identifying of common interests, or you know the planning or the implementation, and maybe just as you know, if if we keep other things in mind, 
uh, we'll get a lot further in all these four stages of like developing a, a relationship. And what are those things? I think first and foremost, go into a relationship with a learning posture. Just be ready to absorb. I think um, we have to be uh, have an open heart and open mind to learning about each other, to learning about our neighbor. Uh, for municipalities, is to learn about our nations that surround our communities that are part of our ecosystem, but just be really open to learning. Uh, along with learning, you have to be, you have to have an open heart to respect and an open mind to respect uh, the ways that uh, that others do things, right? From governance to land management to ecosystem stewardship, to be open to that and respect those ways of life, as well as ceremony. Ceremony is very important to learn about ceremony uh, and respect ceremony. Also be honest, uh, be honest about what you know and what you don't know. Uh, be honest about assumptions you may have. If you're open, honest, respectful, you'll get a learning, a lot, a lot of learning done, right? Other things that really go a long way, uh, perhaps is regular communication. And this communication can be in different ways. It could be sharing, uh, sharing a coffee with uh, local counselors, right? Uh, it could be sharing a, a feast could be sharing a meal, but this regular contact really goes a long way. We all know that the handshake or that fist bump, you know, could go a long way. But nowadays, pick up the phone, be in regular communications, uh, give time for their relationship to grow. We often say in my line of work or in, in the partnerships that we have is that we operate at the speed of trust, right? So we have to trust each other. We have to know each other. But that takes time. There's a lot of healing to do, right? And when there is a lot of healing to do, there is there is a lot of time that's needed. So don't rush into a relationship. Uh, part of this is also be, being prepared to have the hard conversations, right? There is hard conversations to have about discrimination, inequalities, racism. But be ready to 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 have those conversations with an open mind and an open heart as well. And take time to adjust you know, to each other as well. And I think finally, once you have all, all, all this learning done and identifying things you can work on or things in common, you can then make a small plan uh, together uh, and an agreement together. How do we move forward together? So that's the action part of things, right? So I think that while you can adopt many frameworks or many models that guide you through, you know, different stages of building our relationship, these, are, these other things that I mentioned, could go a long way into building the relationship more than the framework can. Thank you so much, Marshall. Uh, maybe Joshua, I want to I want to uh, pass it over to you. If if you have any comments on anything Marshall was saying, or more generally, kind of the idea of approaches you think that are really fundamental in building partnerships, or how to nurture partnerships. Yeah, no, thanks. I, I think Marshall covered it very, very well. Um, we uh, we too, uh, CAP has uh, published a, uh, a reconciliation uh, toolkit for, for businesses, and it talks about very much the exact same things that uh, that Marshall has. And uh, uh, I think Paul's going to, oh, no, I see the reconciliation toolkit just popped up in the chat. Um, and it, uh, it it too take you know looks at these uh, the same things that that Marshall uh, just laid out, uh, and it uh, gives a lot of resources. Um, it goes through the history why uh, uh, you know UNDRIP and, and Section thirty five rights are, are important. Why reconciliation is important, um, and um, it's it seeks to help. And that's what it's and that's what it's about. And I think you could go to a lot of organizations. They may have a, a toolkit that's pretty that's published, but certainly many indigenous organizations have already thought about these things and can help uh, anybody who's who's wanting to know how can uh, how can they be a part of, of reconciliation. Um, the one thing I think that I would add, and this is just from experience, um, is that um, it it's it's not just in you know the sort of big grandiose bringing together uh, uh, leaders and devising a plan and and uh, and assigning certain work and 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 tracking that and all of that. Those are those are important things, but reconciliation uh, can you know it can happen 
at the, the personal personal level as well and just that phone call and uh and and, and start where you're at right you don't be afraid um you know there's there's a, a vulnerability i think on all sides when it, it comes to exploring this we're, we're in uncharted territory we really are um and uh you know i've i've heard of people talking about reconciliation as a personal objective and i've heard the supreme court talk about reconciliation as a sovereignty issue right it's the whole gamut of canadian society and so uh what i would add would be to make a commitment uh to reconciliation wherever you're at it doesn't have to be a big grandiose plan it could be something small make a commitment to that relationship with uh, the, the the organization or the individuals that you want to work with and then work on making that uh, relationship better and learning and being open and honest and, and and all the all the things that Marshall very eloquently said and I think you'll get there you know it's going to take time as Marshall said we run on the speed of trust and trust takes time to build and so I encourage everybody to look at, uh, you know, to, to reach out to whatever organization and, and ask, you know, like where, what do you think is reconciliation? And, you know, would you, would you want to, uh, to work together? And let's just start from where we're at and uh, figure out, figure it out as we go. Thank you. Maybe Jenica, I'll give you an opportunity on that question too, but um uh i might also ask you know if you could introduce some of the challenges that you know in building these kinds of partnerships and relationships you know do you see certain things that really jeopardize those efforts uh maybe you know don't don't encourage trust building so feel free to answer on that that first part but it also flow into the second if you're if you're up for it sure yeah thank you um i think joshua and marshall have um covered the the first question really well and i think yeah what i have to say probably sort of answers both both questions um in that there there can't really be a, a one size fits all approach to relationship and partnership building um within the mount Aerosmith biosphere region we've developed guidelines um for engagement and a culture of engagement with our First Nations, um, and these could certainly be replicated in other contexts, but we develop them locally um, in collaboration here for what they mean with our partnerships. Um, and a lot of the things that Marshall and Joshua discussed are within those guidelines. Um, but that can also be a challenge, right, is, is how to understand how an approach might fit within the context of the community that you're working with or communities that you're working with um, because they all are very diverse. Um, and I think another a, a challenge, I guess, as well with that is depending on the knowledge system and social structure that you're used to, these approaches introduce their own challenges. So as settlers, um, these approaches to things on learning behaviors, on learning languages um, and societal kind of things that we've been taught is challenging and we have to commit the time to do so, which um, can be hard when you're still operating within some of these westernized non-Indigenous structures. So um, at MABRI, at our research institute, some of the work that we've done that relates specifically to the SDGs and to UNDRIP was looking at how co-led and Indigenous-led research approaches um, work through the braiding of knowledge systems in a diversity of ways. And um, while I can't say that I've firsthand experienced some of these challenges or pitfalls, so to speak, um, talking with a lot of other researchers and knowledge holders about their experiences in this did bring to light um, some of the things that that happen within the world of research and knowledge sharing. And um, because researchers and scientists have been trained traditionally in an academic structure, uh, there's a lot of unlearning to do, especially when it comes to research within Indigenous communities. Um, and a lot of what we heard is that there, there's a lot of harm that has to be dealt with now relating to how research is conducted about Indigenous peoples, about their lands, without them 
being included in this research without them having access to the data that's being collected on their lands and about them. Um, and so there is a shift happening in terms of Indigenous communities and researchers being able to take back that research and to bring it back to themselves. Um, and there is a shift and expansion, I think, happening within the world of research and within academia, I think, as well, that is aiming to support more capacity building for Indigenous led work and research, but it still often remains a challenge that the structure of academia and science does lack some of that fluidity and flexibility that we need to have these meaningful relationships or support Indigenous led work. Um, because with doing this work is grant funding and things like that, and there's timelines and deliverables and deadlines that have to go into that. Um, but I have seen some really creative ways to work around those challenges in terms of kind of redefining what research might mean in a collaborative way. Um, and it was mentioned a little bit earlier, the importance of acknowledging and recognizing and understanding cultural protocol and ceremony. Um, and those are the kinds of things that can be recognized as research because it, it's there's indigenous knowledge and indigenous science that goes into those things. Um, and we kind of just have to explore shift, I guess, our perspective of how we think about what research means. And we don't even need to necessarily use that terminology. Um, but yeah, I think it's just creating the space and the time and the ability to be flexible is sort of a very generalized approach, but in itself is also a challenge, I guess, so to speak. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave that there for mm -hmm. now. And yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think it's an interesting example with kind of academia and thinking about deadlines and grants and, you know, publishing and how that kind of schedule would present its own. I mean, it has its own challenges in its own, but when you're trying to create deeper partnerships, um, that can really, I think, erode that sense of trust and relationship building or it has the potential to. Anyways, so. Um, maybe Marshall uh, or Joshua, if, if either, maybe Marshall, we can start. If you have any comments on that, any anything that you see in the in this work, uh, especially with you know the SETI work uh, that you're that you're leading, it's you know, are you seeing common pitfalls where these relationships kind of go off course because of certain approaches, or is it? Yeah, do you have any any thoughts on that? Well, I think I think look. Uh... I'll put my municipal hat on for this one, right? Uh, I think municipalities are so driven by a certain calendar in the political sphere, right? Of budgets and fiscal years and, and you know, an election or something coming up. The things must get done at a certain time. So I think what end up, ends up happening most of the time is that um, we're rushing to get somewhere, right? And we're not really paying attention to the real realities of uh, our neighbors, right? They function in a different way, in a different timeline, with more, um, with more attuned to cultural and social aspects rather than a calendar line and timelines. So of course, band councils also also have pressures, right, of of getting things done, of, of implementing projects that come from the community, but. Uh, the calendar is different. So I think one of the pitfalls uh, that we can fall into, and this, this is why SETI acts as a convener or broker in the middle to kind of negotiate with both sides. Okay, look, we're hearing you that there's these pressures here and they want to show progress there, but there's got to be a balance of how we move through our partnership and communicate to both communities and to different funders and to different uh, um, uh, key players in, in the ecosystem to get stuff done. But I don't think rushing because of sake of, uh, of um, you know, a certain calendar timeline goes a long way, right? We might skip very learning, uh, key learning opportunities along the way because we're rushing or we're not paying attention to, to, to realities, right? Often we do a lot of workshops to, to kind of move things along in SETI but we often, you know, um, 
here I'm in Sao Paulo, oh, how about, you know, uh, September for a workshop? That sounds really great. And then right away we might hear, look, September, October, mid to mid mid month to mid month is not a good time for us we have to you know go out for the community hunt and fill our freezers so none of your none of none of our counselors are going to be available we're going to be out uh you know with the community hunt with different groups at certain times you know and 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 that's where we have to listen to each other right so we don't fall in that in the pitfall of not knowing what the reality is and, and being really good at communicating each other's realities and, and, and societal life, right? So I would say most of all, that's what we uh, try to avoid is that pitfall of rushing through things because of, of a certain calendar, right? Timing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Joshua, over to you on this one. And, and maybe I can ask also, um, if you don't mind to think about like, are there examples you can share that you you think are good examples of kind of how partnerships have developed um, that might inspire those on the call today or just kind of be points of interest for people to explore? So first, if you want on the the pitfalls of these yeah. partnerships, or if, if you feel like it's been covered, you can move on, but up to you. You know, thanks, John. No, I, I think it's been very well covered. I would just add one uh, one other thing. Uh, and this is back to my earlier remark about um, transformation uh, or transformative change. And that is, um, I think, our, one of our biggest pitfalls that we have is trying to use tools that were designed uh, that are inappropriate for what we're trying to accomplish. Um, we are in, we are still in a colonial system. I, uh, you know, it's people, people's backs get up uh, when, when I say that. Um, but when you, when you look at the indigenous uh, way of life, the indigenous way of governance, the indigenous way of, of knowing, uh, of, um, of using resources compared to uh, the, the way that those decisions are, are made and actions done, in the in the in the current uh, Canadian context, you can very you can see uh, a very uh, very a quite stark difference. Um, and so, uh, this, you know, advancement on the SDGs, uh, reconciliation for sure requires us to rethink our institutions, our, our decision making processes, or the tools that we have, and uh, and to and to uh, come up with something. Uh, better that is a, a tool fit for purpose. Uh, and I think, you know, even when you talk internationally about transformative change, you know, the very first thing that's brought up is that, you know, the underlying cause of the crisis that we're in, whether it's sustainable development or climate change or biodiversity, uh, pollution, what have you, uh, the underlying cause of that is a, a society that's built on the domination of people and and uh, and also um, nature and so that's what we're needing to undo is that that system uh so that's uh that's that's a big uh philosophical <laughs> discussion i guess uh I'll just add that piece but you know certainly i think there are many many examples where um this uh this uh work for sustainable development and reconciliation has, has, has clearly worked. Uh, and, and one of the inspiring uh, examples that, that I've been privileged to be a part of is um, one of our affiliate uh, organizations in Nova Scotia, the Native Council of Nova Scotia, in, uh, in the 90s initiated its fisheries. And the, the genesis of this um, for working with government and other organizations. I mean, we've fished for time immemorial, but as far as an economic development initiative and a rights uh, recognition initiative came out again from another Supreme Court decision. That was the Supreme Court in Sparrow in 1990. Uh, and shortly thereafter, you know, the there was an impetus by the government now to implement that decision and uh, it aligned with our desires to be a, a bit more into the Atlantic commercial fisheries for economic livelihood as well as for people's own personal food uh, needs. And so worked out a relationship uh, in 92, which turned into a, 
a, a, an Aboriginal fisheries arrangement in, in 1995. And that was, and, and the arrangement was very simple. It was to co-develop a cooperative uh, arrangement that was renewed annually between the department and uh, the NCNS on the use, um, uh, protection, conservation uh, of Atlantic fisheries. And, and and specifically the fisheries that we would um, that we would partake in, you know, so it covered all areas of, of management, uh, and from that we developed uh, uh, agreements around uh, food purposes as well as licenses to engage in commercial fisheries, which we call Aboriginal communal commercial fisheries. That's been a long time to build that, and and many political obstacles along the way but because we were able to that that one little seed um, have been able to engage other partners in the Dalhousie University uh, Memorial University um, engage with uh, environmental groups uh, obviously with uh, the different fishing associations we belong to to I think every fishing association you can think of in Nova Scotia and over those past couple of decades have built that up to um, uh, you know, five million dollar annually uh, commercial or communal commercial fishery with um, I think somewhere around seventeen or eighteen vessels. They own a wharf. They own a lobster pound. Uh, other other facilities employ well, approximately fifty people on board those vessels, uh, as well as another dozen or so who are who are um, you know ancillary to that, plus some administrative uh, staff. So it's become a real economic and employment driver for the Native Council of Nova Scotia. And um, it's something the council takes great pride in. And the, the report every year is, um, you know, not only does the uh, Mamej Seafoods, uh, who, who operates the communal commercial fishery, have its own uh, organization separate from NCNS and has its own general assembly, but also still presents that every year to the Native Council's annual General Assembly and gets resolutions passed uh, for the continuance of it and for, for accepting the, um, the, the outcomes of it for that year. So it's very uh, involved with the community uh, from that aspect, as well as uh, training uh, and other training and economic development initiatives um, and, and works very closely with its um, what we call ISETs or Indigenous Skills Employment Training Strategy, <laughs> if I can get the acronyms right, um, and uh, it, in, you know to develop uh, uh, young men and women into becoming um, you know commercial uh, harvesters, so, uh, aquatic harvesters. And uh, which is a very dangerous, dangerous profession to be in. So it takes in the whole gamut of, of safety at sea, and uh, as well as uh, the you know how to actually process fish and market fish, and and uh, and as well as people to uh, to work on the conservation side. Uh, and you know the Native Council of Nova Scotia has been able to build that. Uh, it, itself internally since the 1990s, but also works with other Native councils, uh, uh, you know, across the country through CAP, um, and um, you know, to share its experiences and its and and, and what has worked, what hasn't worked, and uh, CAP itself has an ISETS program uh, that works with the count with all the all the councils on you know employment counseling, skills training. Uh, wage subsidies, uh, self-employment uh, assistance, you know, to develop a business plan or, or what have you. And, and and certainly in the area of strategic partnerships, uh, which is, for example, what, you know, what uh, developed this uh, toolkit that I re refer referenced earlier. So, you know, from a small kernel, you, you, you grow that, you, you feed it, you water it, and it grows. And it's something that, um, the entire community can build off of, and other communities can take an example from. So uh, that's uh, that's one area, one example I think that is uh, quite uh, uh, quite inspiring. Uh, that uh, yes, we can uh, we can achieve uh, change.
yeah to see how that's grown over the years into into what it is today is that's um yeah very inspiring thank you um there are a couple questions coming in on the q a so i might try and weave them in here as jenica and marshall ask you a similar question around um <clears throat> examples that you think might you know are particularly successful or uh inspirational to others and there was a question that fits with that from tara in the chat uh, talking about collaboration between Indigenous and non-Indigenous collaborators that's gone very well and what that partnership looked like, what people felt contributed to it being so positive. So I don't know if that's already part of what you're thinking in terms of an example, but keep that in mind if it is, and maybe uh, we could weave that in. So Jenica, maybe over to you. Um, we're running a little bit short on time, so we'll try and get to as many Q&A questions as we can, everybody. Um, but over to you, Jenica. Sure. Thanks. Yeah, I'll try and keep it quick. Um, I think I ha I I have to plug biosphere regions um, because because of the localized context and the approach that's taken within all the individual biosphere regions across Canada and across the world. Um, and it's it's utilizing kind of overarching ideas or like the intent, the spirit and intent of frameworks like the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and figuring out in collaboration with local Indigenous communities, how can these things be supported or implemented in a way that um, does create positive relationships in in a way that's meaningful in that context. Um, and the way that biosphere regions do that is thanks Kate <laughs> for the link um, is yeah it's just unique and it recognizes that there is no one size fits all to reconciliation across Canada um, because individual communities have their unique challenges their unique priorities and things that need to be addressed um, as do all the individual research institutes organizations etc that partner with them um, Another mention I would like to make is um, to an organization that helped fund a lot of the work that our research institute has done in this kind of partnership building sense and looking at the SDGs and UNDRIP together, um, which is the Canadian Mountain Network, which is transitioning, um, undergoing an organizational transition to Braiding Knowledge as Canada. And so they have funded um, research programs and knowledge sharing initiatives across Canada that are co-led and Indigenous-led. Um, in, in the last few years, it's been mainly focused around mountain systems. They're transitioning away to broaden that scope. Um, and as they become Breeding Knowledge as Canada, the, the focus is really on enhancing the influence um, and support for self-determined place-based research, co-produced knowledge um, in a way that continues on the path towards reconciliation um, so that Indigenous and local knowledge approaches contribute more to public policy and decision-making um, and just the the breadth of knowledge that we have in terms of our natural landscapes um, and, and the, the places that we're living and working and operating within. Um, so this is also, this is an organization that kind of provides that overarching ability to take funding that there it's federal government funding and utilize that funding in a way that provides flexibility and fluidity in research that incorporates um, not incorporates, but prioritizes cultural protocol, revitalization of language and culture, um, sharing and uplifting Indigenous knowledge in a way that also acknowledges that Western science has a role to play and is also has an importance to bring to the table. Um, yeah, I will leave it there. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Marshall, um, with the... We're not going to get to all the questions that we had planned as a panel. I'm sorry, we probably won't get into the Q&A too deep either. But Marshall, we'd love to, love to hear from you. Um, you work with a lot of different Indigenous, non-Indigenous partnership building efforts. Are there, is there an example from your work or from elsewhere that you've seen that, that stands out to you that you'd like to share? Look, I won't mention probably something too, too specific, but we have to keep in mind that success is defined in different ways to many different peoples, to many different contexts. Uh, but uh, without uh, probably naming 
uh, a certain community, but I'll give you some examples that communities themselves have said are success. <laughs> In one partnership, I had both both sides uh, of the partnership, the municipal side and the nation side saying, this is the first time in probably 50 years since the last time that two councils got together and were able to share a meal. And we were able to share about what's going on in our communities. You know, oh, you're doing that? We're actually, we were thinking the same thing. Actually, that could be something interesting that could be worked on together, right? And it gets the ball rolling. Another community found that each other communities knew nothing about each other. And they know that the key is, is the future, is the future generations. So together, they were able to come and organize something as simple as a hot dog, hot chocolate, and a skate night for the communities. We're talking the small rural communities, but they came together and celebrated youth right and that future together of the new generation coming together knowing about each other and it was a fun night it was a skate night it was a celebration night it was um you know of coming together right and then other other communities say you know uh success to us is uh actually uh having a list of uh people on each side who when it's something about um say the local beach i know who to call and I now have a connection to somebody to talk about, hey, listen, we've heard that there is this issue. Can we talk about it? Can we meet about it? Can we plan to do something about it? So success is, is relative, you know, to 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 very specific contexts and needs. So I think for, for us, success is just getting the two sides to communicate, be open to each other, and to and to really share experiences and be open. To, to that communication. So I think there's a lot. Of course, if you go on the SETI webpage on the SETI partnerships.ca, there's very specific examples, very specific projects that have been successful. But when we really look at the more sustainable uh, local action, I think there's a lot there to call success. And that's just the human connection to keep on, to keep on dialog di dialoguing for more things to come and for more things and for more planning, right? A success, you can you can achieve a certain target, but there has to be more after that. Thank you, thank you so much, Marshall. Thank you to all of our speakers. I know there was a question, and I'm sorry, Heather, we didn't uh, we weren't able to get to it, but talking about uh, OCAP training and data collection and management, um, maybe we'll try and follow up with that by email, Heather. If there's any responses, um, we can we can explore that uh, further. But I think given that we're close to the top of the hour, I'll just say thank you to Joshua, Jenica, and Marshall for joining us today, sharing your insights and your knowledge. Um, thank you for your work and um, look forward to continuing to stay engaged together and see how, if, you know, where the, the cross sections are for our, for our future collaborations as well. So with that, I'll pass it over to Laura to do a, a small close. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you once again to all the speakers. That was a fantastic session, such a rich discussion. And thank you, John, for facilitating. Thank you all for being here, everyone who could join us. So for next month, we're gonna follow up on this topic, actually. We're gonna dive a little deeper into it. I encourage you all to join that one. That's on February 27th. And if you're registered for today's session, you'll automatically get an invitation for that. And I would invite us to maybe think between now and then on that. Um, commitment that we can all make and what that might be, that commitment um, that we can make wherever we're at. Um, I really appreciated that from Joshua. And um, I want to just share a couple things as we head off. The survey for um, some feedback, if you can take a moment to offer feedback, that'd be much appreciated. And um, we also want to share that ESDC is inviting input to its 2024 annual report on the SDGs by a questionnaire to fill by February 29th. So if you'd like to contribute, the link is going to be in the chat in a second. There's also SDG Week Canada 2024, which will be held March 4th to 8th. So please um, stay tuned and submit an expression of interest form if you'd like to participate during that week, which will be shared in the chat. 
And I know we're throwing a lot of things at you in the chat. This will all be compiled along with the recording from today and resources that were shared um, in a follow-up email in the next couple of days. So once again, thank you all for being here and we look forward to seeing you on February 27th. Thank you.